the Bible reading here is in two parts. Uh, Exodus 4.29 to 5.9 and Exodus 5.19 to 21. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites. And Aaron told them everything the Lord has said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord the, uh, the Lord of the God of Israel says, Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival for me, uh, to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? And I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The, Lord, the God of the Hebrews have met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues and with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave the order to the slave drivers and overseas in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice our God, to our God. Make, the work, make, them, uh, make the work harder for the people so that they can keep working and paying no attention to lies. Exodus 5, 19 to uh, 21. The Israelite overseas re, uh, re realized that they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officers and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Thank you. Greetings. Um, I'm wearing my lucky gold pants. Um, I know the, Moses, uh, the Matildas have trained for years and they've worked really, really hard, but this is the true reason why they won last night. I was wearing my lucky gold pants for them like I have for the last few Matildas games and I am refusing to take them off until Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> and who knows after that, we may keep going. Um, but yes, uh, Jaslyn and I swapped texts last night uh, when we both realised we'd scream so loud when, um, when that final penalty was shot by Courtney Vine that um, we actually lost our voice. <laughs> and she's saying, I'm leading worship and I'm like, I'm preaching, we've got to get this back. So praise God for the miracle overnight um, that my voice fully returned. She's still a bit husky, but she's, she, she sang beautifully, so that was great. Um, I'm going to be, uh, the guys, uh, Dave and Caleb, both said to me, um, you know, would you preach while we're at men's camp? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And they said, we've given you the plagues. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys. Um, <laughs> so Ashley preaching from chapter four to the end of chapter 10, that's seven chapters this morning. We'll be here to lunch. Um, no, <laughs> it's okay. It's not going to take quite that long. Um, and the question uh, we're going to be asking uh, is, who or what is your God? So where have we been? Exodus 1, Dave asked the question, is Pharaoh stronger? And we know what the answer to that was. 
uh, of course, Yahweh was. Exodus 2, how can God bring good out of this? Uh, that's when um, the Hebrews were facing the fact that Pharaoh had made this rule that all the boys uh, would, would be killed. Um, and somehow uh, God worked his miracle and Moses survived. Uh, last week, Caleb said, is God at the centre of your story? Um, which is a powerful question. Um, and this week, who is God of your life? Um, these, these questions actually go round and round and round in Exodus. Uh, it's really interesting how these questions get repeated. Um, I wanted to start at Exodus 4 because I just want to continue um, the storytelling that Caleb started last week. Um, because, of course, we had Moses, you know, there before the burning bush, before Yahweh. And, um, and the question, you know, he, he wasn't feeling really secure in himself, was he? He asked five questions of God. Um, but then we see right in the next chapter, he meets up with Aaron, just as Yahweh had said he would, his brother was coming. And then Moses goes to the people and he performs the signs in front of the people, the signs that God told him to. So he throws down the staff and it turns into a snake. And then he picks it up, it's the staff again, and he puts his hand into his cloak and brings it out and it's got a skin disease, leprosy perhaps, and then he puts it back and then it's clean again. Um, and the people see these things and they believe. And then they start worshipping Yahweh. And I can just imagine at that point, Moses is saying, whoa, awesome, We're, this is great, this is going so well. So I suspect that when he went to see Pharaoh, he was actually feeling pretty positive, he and Aaron, as they go to Pharaoh. But what is Pharaoh's response? Pharaoh's response is, is pretty strong. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. And thus we have this declaration that Pharaoh is not going to let the people go. And then he goes even further because he then makes the life even harder for the Hebrew slaves. Previously, they had straw that was put for them so they could make the bricks. And now Pharaoh says they're going to have to get their own straw. They're going to have to walk out there, get the straw, collect the straw. And he's not going to let them make less bricks. They have to make the same number of bricks. So their life is even harder. And so at the end of chapter 5, it looks pretty dire actually because they are the Israelites and they're saying um, to Moses and Aaron, what have you done? You've just made our life so much harder. And I can imagine that this was a really low point for Moses. Already in two chapters, we've gone from the highs to the lows. And the reason I wanted to say that is that there's a bit of a cycle of stuff that goes on over the ensuing chapters, which means we don't have to read them all individually. Basically, God, Yahweh says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. Sometimes he says, yes, no. <laughs> but that's basically it. And God's people suffer here. And God's response is that he shows his power. And he shows his power with the ten plagues. Now, I wonder how many of you can name the ten plagues. I want you just to chat to each other. How many of the plagues can you come up with? Let's see how many. Go for it. Okay, time is coming up. Let's see. Anyone who's Googling, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> okay, so here they are, the ten plagues. Water turns to blood. Frogs. 
gnats or lice, flies, disease on livestock, unhealable boils, hail and fire, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. Okay, hands up if you've got more than five. Oh, good. Keep them up if you've got more than seven. Ooh. Anyone get all ten? Oh, children's ministry, that's you. <laughs> See, children love this story. I mean, it's, it's, it's got all the elements of great story, isn't it? I mean, it's got bleh, elements, water turning to blood. Yuck, yuck. Uh, it's got creatures, insects, all those elements. Um, I actually Googled, I was going to play a video, um, and there was uh, an American family, I suspect homeschoolers, um, who had this, uh, sorry, had this whole thing of... Um, their children acting out the ten plagues. And it's sort of portrayed as sort of a fun story. Um, but it's actually, it's a hard story. It's, it's a really, it's a horrible story. There is, these are terrible plagues. We've, we've just survived a mini plague in the last three years. It's a terrible story. And there's one element that I've always really struggled with, and that's the element of Pharaoh's heart. If you know this story well, there's a few times I said Pharaoh sometimes says yes and then no. Um, and it says, sometimes it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened and sometimes it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart and I really have struggled with that. And um, I've made peace with it in three sorts of ways. I'm not sure you, you might have other ideas about this. Um, one thing is, God knows Pharaoh's hearts. We've got to remember that these Pharaohs, they were, they were pretty, pretty mean guys. <laughs> like, okay, that's, that's not right. They had incredible power. They believed themselves that they were gods. Um, and they were harsh. And they'd been harsh. We already saw the previous Pharaoh, chapter 1, had said, you know, all the Hebrew sons should be killed. Um, just what we heard read this morning, you know, that, that Hero made these people suffer, suffer terribly. Um, that he had a hard heart already. Um, so perhaps God saw that and, and knew the way that he was to respond. The second thing is um, that the plagues actually represent all the Egyptian gods. So perhaps all the plagues had to be acted out so that God could definitively display that he was over all the Egyptian gods. We're going to see more of this in a moment. And I think that's probably a fair assumption as well. But I think ultimately, sometimes, if you've had something in your life and you cannot see anything good in it, um, and you're not understanding what God is doing, um, and in this case, I have to say God is God. There's mystery here. I don't understand it now. His ways are higher, Isaiah 55 says, than ours. So we, I'm a human. He is God. I'm not going to understand everything that God does. Um, but that is one part that I do struggle with uh, in the story, that God is God. And that is really what this story is all about. So let's have a look at um, all the Egyptian gods that God actually shows he's better than in this story. Okay, so plague one. Plague one is that the Nile turns to blood. Now, the goddess of the Nile was Isis. She was also the goddess of fertility. And really, the Nile, the river, was the life force for all of Egypt. Uh, most of the people lived in the Nile Valley. Egypt's a very dry country. There's a lot of desert. The Nile was absolutely what they depended on. So this, this first plague was really significant um, because it turned their, their life force into blood, into undrinkable water. And God says in Exodus 7, 17, by this you will know that I am the Lord. So that's the first plague. The second plague was over the goddess Heket, who was the frog-headed God of Egypt. I was going to make a joke about French frogs being beaten anyway, but I won't. Um, but <laughs> uh, the frogs, frogs were re revered in Egypt because they could live in both land and sea, so they were seen as sacred. Um, and one of the interesting things is that it, people were forbidden from killing frogs 
But what happens as part of this plague when God stops the frogs is that they all died. Uh, they died in the houses, the courtyards and in the fields. They were piled into heaps and the land reeked of them. So that was a further sort of God saying, I am Lord over this. Okay, plague three, the gnats. Um, this was uh, a triumph over the god Set, who was the god of the desert areas where the gnats were believed to come from. And uh, this is the first plague where the Egyptian magicians in the court were unable to reproduce the miracle. So they'd, they'd turned water into blood, um, they'd managed to um, produce frogs, but they were unable to uh, produce all the gnats or to stop the gnats. And so the magicians themselves at this point say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So already um, they're accepting that this is a God who is higher than um, their gods. And then we have plague four, the flyers, flies. This is Uachit, the goddess. She was the goddess of swarms. Um, and this is the first time that actually the Israelites are spared. So they were impacted by the first three plagues. But at this point, the Israelites start to be spared the impact of the plagues. The next plague is the one where the livestock uh, are diseased and die. And this is over the god Apis, um, who was one of the higher gods. Um, and in fact, you know, this is a, a spoiler alert for later in our Exodus series, but um, it's probably because of this god that the people of Egypt, uh, the Israelites in the desert, made the golden calf. Apis was really revered as a god. Um, but the livestock were all killed. And again, the Israelites were spared. Pharaoh's didn't, Pharaoh didn't really believe the Israelites could be spared, so he actually sent investigators to see if, if the Israelite animals were able to live, and they were. Okay, plague six. This is um, over the goddess Sekhmet. Um, so she was the goddess of medicines and healing. Um, and you'll notice on her head, um, actually it was on Apis's head as well, there's the sign of the sun. Uh, the sun was the highest god of all, Ra, and um, the, god, the gods that have a sun over them are the higher level gods. Um, and you'll notice she also has the cobra as well. And Pharaoh himself, um, in his headdress, would have a sign of the sun and the cobra, and this was a sign of being um, god material. So the boils break out on all the people. Uh, interestingly, at this point, the magicians can't stand before Moses because of the boils. So this is, this is the point at which, you know, this is beyond human magic or, or even magicians who are trying to access their gods as well and their, their magic. At this point, there's a moment of grace. There's a moment of grace where God warns Pharaoh, this next series of plagues are going to be even worse. This is your chance. This is your chance to let the people go. And he says, the next series of plague will convince you that there is none like me on all the earth. In other words, I am God over all the other gods. And God actually warns Pharaoh through Moses that they should collect all the livestock and all the crops that they've got and put them somewhere safe. So he's, he's warning them, this, this is going to be traumatic. This is going to be terrible. Some of Pharaoh's servants respond to this, but Pharaoh's heart is hard. Okay, the next one is hail. And this is over the goddess Nut. She, uh, Nut, sorry. Uh, she is the goddess uh, of the sky, and she's portrayed as in hieroglyph uh, hieroglyphics and paintings as, as a woman uh, who is naked, but she's got stars on her body. So she's the night sky and the day sky. And of course, hail comes from the sky. So this is a definitive sign that, um, that God is God over her. And what happened was, uh, as often happens in Australia uh, when we have storms, is that lightning came down as well. So there was hail falling from the sky and there was fires started by lightning um, that went through all the crops as well. So a devastating storm. Um, it says in the text that Egypt had never seen a storm like this. The eighth plague is the plague of locusts. And uh, this was... 
um, to conquer the god Osiris. Osiris uh, was the god of agriculture, uh, was linked to Isis, and again, one of the, the pantheon of gods, the higher gods. Um, and uh, this, what the locusts did, they, they basically um, killed off any of the crops that might have survived the hail and the lightning. So at that point, all of Egypt knew there would be no food, um, no harvest that year. The Israelites were told they would see God's power and know that he was the Lord, it says in the text. Okay, we're coming up to the final plagues. Plague nine. Plague nine is darkness. And that is God, Yahweh, saying he is God over Ra, who was supposed to be the God over all the gods. Ra. There was darkness for three days. And yet the Israelites were spared. The Israelites had light. And no one could explain it. And then we come to the 10th plague. I'm not going to say too much about this because um, this will be part of the sermon next week. But this is the plague of the death of the firstborn. And once again, primarily the goddess in sight here is Isis. She was not only the goddess of the Nile, the goddess of fertility and life. And she was supposed to be the protector of children. Um, and she was definitively defeated in this 10th plague. It's very sober, isn't it? It's very somber, this story. There are patterns in this story. Andrew Reid, um, an Australian uh, theologian, biblical scholar, has written a commentary in Exodus, and he finds these patterns, and I, I found this really interesting. So he talks about three series and then a climax, and there's sort of three groups of plagues um, that come together in each of them. And in each time, there's a warning, there's... Yes, yes, and then there's no warning. Yes, yes, no warning. Yes, yes, no warning, and a final warning. And there are words of instruction to um, Moses and Aaron here too. Um, station yourself, go to Pharaoh, and then no words of instruction. Station yourself, go to Pharaoh. Station yourself, go to Pharaoh. And the actor, the person who actually acts to, to bring about the plague. So for the first three, it's Aaron who actually holds out his hand. There's special instructions given to Aaron at this point about what to do. So three times, Aaron is the one who does the actions. Um, and then God just does uh, the plagues. And then it's Moses who is instructed to hold out his hand and so on. And I even find that interesting in terms of you know, how Moses has come, like he was the one who was saying no, 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 and send my brother, etc. And suddenly at this point, what we have is um, it's Moses who's actually the one who's stepping forward at this point um, to obey Yahweh and to do the actions. Um, so we see that Moses is on the, a journey in this as well. I um, don't want to say too much about this, except that this is these are patterns that help us remember the story. Um, this is... Uh, this is a story that was told and retold, retold, retold. It's still told and retold. Um, it's still a story that is absolutely fundamental to Jewish and Israelite understanding of their story. Um, and it's a story in some ways that, that we envelop into the Christian story as well. Um, all through the Psalms, this story gets retold as well. It's such a significant story um, for understanding who God is and what he's doing. As well as those patterns, there is something that I hadn't really seen before, which is the pattern of creation and uncreation. So Pharaoh in Exodus 1 says he has the power over life and death. It's at the end of Exodus 1 when he says, you know, kill all uh, the, the sons of these Israelites. So he's setting himself as having power. He's setting himself up as God over the life of the Israelites. But God is the true God. He's the creator. And he reveals he has power not only over creation, but he has power to uncreate as well. In Genesis 1, Yahweh spends seven days creating the world. He speaks ten times. And then here we have God speaking and ten times decreates. And then he stops it and brings flourishing again. And so we see that waters which separate to form land and life in Genesis 1 now represent death when it turns to blood. Animals on crops which are for human consumption are themselves consumed. Light 
is turned to darkness. Humans are destroyed. And I was thinking about this and I was just thinking, what are we doing to the world? Um, it's almost like humans are, are trying to uncreate the world. Um, I'm thinking just before we came, I saw the pictures of Maui and Hawaii and the devastation of those wildfires and just thinking about the impact of climate change. Last, um, last weekend, David and I went to Cremorne Orpheum to see Oppenheimer and just thinking about the power of that bomb to uncreate the world. Um, we constantly make ourselves almost into gods um, in terms of controlling. But God is the true creator. He has power over uncreation. Jesus was there at the beginning. He actually is the one who uncreates evil. <laughs> so Pharaoh was God. There were the Egyptian gods. God has proved that he's stronger than Pharaoh. He's stronger than all the Egyptian gods. Now, we're probably, I suspect that, that you guys don't have statues of Egyptian gods in your house. Um, we don't have gods like that anymore. But my question is, what is God of your life? What do we do to, to give other things God-like authority in our life? Sometimes it can be work. Work was something that is given to us as a gift. Sometimes we can turn it into a God that determines what we do, that we worship. Houses, possessions, they're gifts to us. And sometimes we can turn them into the thing that determine what we do, why we do it, when we do it. Sometimes they're the things by which we feel good about ourselves that give us security. And I think we can even turn family sometimes into God. We can almost worship our children. We can think about them all the time. We can worry about them. We can think that they have authority over us to determine what we do, when we do it, how we feel. Or maybe it's something else. I will try not to make the Matildas God of my life this week. <laughs> maybe it's something else. Whatever you think about all the time, whatever you determines what you choose to do, that is the thing that is God of your life. And really, God is the one who should be the God of our lives. He was showing all the Egyptians, he was showing all the Israelites, he is the one true God who determines their lives, a lesson they would hopefully never forget, but human hearts are fickle. Now, my job as preacher is both to convict you and also to encourage you. Um, so I think that we saw right at the beginning the Israelites, they were fearful, weren't they? They feared Pharaoh. They feared the gods of Egypt. And I want to say that we don't have to fear any Pharaoh. We don't have to fear any government authority. We don't have to fear the times because we have this incredible promise that is live to us through Jesus. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be encouraged. We can go to other gods because we're fearful, but we don't have to fear because of what Jesus has done and who our God is. Let me pray for us. And I'm going to pray using some of the words that we heard earlier. Father God, I pray that you would heal our hearts and make them clean. Open up our eyes to the things unseen around us, the, the spiritual battles that are going on. Open our eyes up to who you are and the power. Show us how to love like you have loved us. You saw the Israelites in their suffering. You heard them and you rescued them. You saw us suffering in our sin and you rescue us. And so now break our heart for what breaks yours, Lord. Help us to give everything we are for your kingdom's cause. 
help us to see how we walk now on earth, but we are also going to walk into eternity because you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the promise keeper. You are the light in the darkness. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the light of the world. You are our God. That is who you are. And we worship you. Amen.